We are being inundated with far too many Batman comics from DC, but there's been one series I've been really looking forward to, Sean Gordon Murphy's Return to the White Knight Universe, Batman Beyond the White Knight. We got the first issue this week. Sean Gordon Murphy is a writer and artist. We get Dave Stewart as the colorist this time instead of Matt, Matt Hollingsworth, who had done the previous few issues. And here to talk with me about that is the DC aficionado, the Batman historian. Josh, are you William Sitter McDonald this week? Oh, I'm McDonald this week. Yeah, okay. I, I decided I was going to, you know, just be myself. So why not? Were you excited about this one? I was very excited. I Like this is, I knew this was going to kick ass. I, you know, I was, I was very excited about this one. I, I feel like Sean Gordon Murphy is, is extremely reliable. Now, hot take, and I might get some hate for this, but I love Batman White Knight. Thought it was great. I thought it was a, a wonderful love letter to Batman fans. Curse of the White Knight. I thought it was just okay. Harley Quinn, okay. This, for uh, maybe it was because Batman Beyond elements were coming into it. I was excited, and I'm happy to say I felt like uh, I got what I wanted. I thought this was a really good read. The art is absolutely fantastic. The story's pretty good. There's a few issues we'll talk about here and there. This isn't a five-star comic, but this is like a, a very strong four, four and a half, you know, highly recommend type comic book. Definitely go and absolutely. check this one out. It's going to be worth your time and money. We'll talk about the art first. Sean Gordon Murphy on this series is a known commodity. Once again, you get those really cool manga influence elements. You get tons of Easter eggs in the background and just fantastic artwork. The only thing missing from this was a cool car chase or something of that nature. Obviously, Sean Gordon Murphy loves cars. Would have liked to see that integrated into the story, but otherwise it looks fantastic. I, and that's never been a subject of question with Sean Gordon Murphy's books. Like His books are always just drawn beautifully there's such an energy to him there's a kinetic energy to his panels like you you feel his books so that's one of the things he always has going for him and, and he definitely delivers here um I, I feel like for whatever reason there's like a rejuvenated energy as well i don't know if it's just because we've had a little bit of a hiatus since a, a white knight book or if it's the fact that new elements are coming in but i i loved it now, getting into the story, we'll, I'll talk about the biggest issue for this for me, and this is probably more of a DC planning, DC editorial issue than a Sean Gordon Murphy issue, is when we get in here, we're, Bruce is in prison, and we're essentially told what has happened with this big moment. There's a prison riot, and he's helping out. We see Dick Grayson shows up. We, we see Signal shows up, and a lot of things have changed. Apparently, Bruce hasn't been kept appraised of everything, and they kind of catch the readers up. And unfortunately, this is essentially – what just played out in Batman with Fear State. You know, it's kind of the magistrate taking over. So they're kind of reusing a story. I don't imagine Sean Gordon Murphy was aware of what was going on there, but the Batman editorial staff should have realized that there might be too many similarities between these stories. There are some similarities. It feels less like a uh, evil doer and I'm doing evil things and it's very blatantly obvious that there's evil things like it seems like it's just a, more of a corrupt politician trying to use money for his own advantage uh, but yeah there, there are some similarities I do think you get some different elements because you have key characters that are tied into this uh, both in opposing and uh, I guess in alignment uh, but you've got Dick Grayson you've got Barbara Gordon uh, Jason Todd and even Duke Thomas and they're all kind of at opposite points uh, with what's going on. So for me, that creates a little bit of a, enough of a different dynamic that I didn't mind it. But besides that, we get this, this Jason Todd stuff fleshed out. We obviously saw him in the very last panel of the last series, which was very exciting. Yeah. And it turns out he's the first Robin and we kind of get a, a retelling of his story and where it doesn't match up with regular DC continuity. When the Joker held him, he didn't kill him. He let him go and freaked him out. He kind of went on his own way to discover himself when he decides to come back and find Bruce Wayne in this flashback, Dick Grayson has arrived and he realized he wasn't special. He wasn't the only Robin. And he kind of, I don't know, did he curse Bruce Wayne and never kind of wanted to be with him again? Yeah. And, you know, he, he came back and he found that he'd been replaced. You were replaceable, Jason Todd. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sure some people are going to take issue with the fact that Jason Todd was the first Robin. I feel like this was came out he already previously. told us that we, yeah they, okay yep, yep, they're yep. just fleshing it out here um you know so I, it is what it is like i didn't mind it i kind of liked the idea that that the reason joker actually let jason todd go and didn't kill him was because he tortured him to the point that he revealed bruce wayne as batman so 
I thought that was an interesting plot, and and I I kind of want to see how that develops if it does develop further. Um, but yeah, like it was fine. It's different. I didn't mind it. It didn't seem egregiously different. And considering this is an Elseworld side, I'm okay with it. I like that there are, there are key differences between this universe that separate it. You know, then you can be like, well, in this universe, this is completely different. I, I like that element to it. Now we do need to get Bruce Wayne breaking himself out of prison. The reason that happens is because apparently Bruce created his own Batman suit that was so dangerous he would never wear it. The old Wayne Manor is under guard, and this Terry McGinnis fella decides to to go down in there, and he discovers it. He's not exactly acting on his own, and he now powers this new Batman suit, and people realize Batman is back in Gotham, and word finally gets to Bruce, and he realizes he better get out there because there are nefarious things. People are using his technology, using his wealth to essentially destroy the city. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, the main reason Terry ends up using the suit is he, he breaks in to try to like find the suit and then the guards, you know, f catch him down there in, in the cave. Um, so to, to, as a means of survival and escape, he, he gets the suit on, you know, and it leads to a, an interesting exchange because he starts understanding why this suit was so dangerous that it wasn't used. And uh, yeah, no, it definitely creates some problems. And I'm sure from Bruce's standpoint, like he doesn't know any of this but he knows how dangerous that suit is and he doesn't know whose hands that it's in. So uh, that, that definitely creates some problems. Well, he knows it's the guy that kind of had the hostile takeover of Wayne Corp is likely behind it. as right. he's used essentially all of his family's wealth and everything he ever created and all the funds that he had meant to go help, you know, poor people and rebuild the city were essentially diverted into creating new technology, elevating the GTO into being this fascist, kind of element within Gotham where it's like a, a city state that's under its own rule. Yeah. I, I, I think what I say when I mentioned he doesn't know who it is, is he doesn't know specifically who's in the suit. Oh, and, yeah. and I think that could probably play some, some things with him too. Like I'm sure he realizes that powers is behind all of this. Like he's got that mm -hmm. figured out. Uh, but I think when you start determining like who is actually wearing that suit and how dangerous could they potentially be, that, that creates other elements of urgency of, okay, I need to get out there. I think maybe the most interesting elements in here that are absolutely brand new, really, to comic books for the most part, is when we finally see Harley Quinn. She's a mm -hmm. single mother. She's got the twins. Apparently, she does not talk to Bruce anymore. They call him Uncle Bruce, and they know that their father is the Joker. She's like, the Joker's not your father. Jack is your father. Mm -hmm. and it turns out one of them, whose name is Bryce, seems to be a Bruce-like character a do-gooder that, that knows what he's supposed to do and follows the rules. And the daughter whose name is Jackie seems to be more of a Joker type character. There's also hints that perhaps they're not twins from the same father. Did you get that vibe as well? Uh, <laughs> I did get that vibe. Uh, yeah. I wondered that and I wasn't sure if it was meant to uh, represent the two sides of between Jack and Joker or meant to actually represent Bruce and then Jack slash Joker. So I, I think both are on the table. I'm curious to see where this goes. I'm not sure if it's just going to be a red herring or if they're actually going to go somewhere with it. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm interested. Um, and, and I spent a good chunk of the issue trying to figure out how much time had passed since we pretty much left off in curse of the white Knight till now and seeing the kids kind of gave you a good idea that it's been about 15, 16 years, probably. And if the two fathers are Jack and Bruce, there's no way that Bryce is Bruce's son. That will be Jack's son. And Jackie will be <laughs> Bruce's son because that is the way they right. do that in, in storytelling. Of course. And then she's going to learn. I saw like, a big bully. Yeah. She's going to learn I've been off base. And then Bryce is going to be like, what the hell? And he's going to spiral downwards. That's that's what happens. So there's a lot of stuff you know cooked into there. And I think that'll be one of the really big elements uh, that pushes Batman Beyond the White Knight forward. Besides the Terry McGinnis, you know, Bruce Wayne conflict now that he's out of prison. I guess we have to talk about this final final bits. You know, Bruce Wade has gotten out. Jason Todd kind of he didn't sanction it, but he didn't stop him either. Right. When he gets out, he's finally getting getting into Gotham City and he's he's climbing. It seems like someone's talking to him. It's definitely got a cadence you recognize, and we see Joker. Is yeah. he alive or do you think this is a figment of his imagination? <sighs> well, you know, I don't know if you looked at the preview pages for the next issue, but they spoil that. So I, I thought that was actually a good question to end the book on. And then they had black and white photos of like the next three pages for issue two. And, and it shows that unfortunately this is 
not the Joker. It's a figment of Bruce's imagination because he tries to punch him and it goes right through him. So I wish DC would have been smart and held off on that. So DC, like, get your shit together. That's exactly the the um, the question that enters your mind when it's done. So it was effective within the Cobble book. Yeah, and it, just. I was going to say, and it said to be continued. So it's meant to be a cliffhanger. Like they they intended for this narratively to be a cliffhanger, and then they just bombed that. I guess I was smart enough not to keep going. I was like, I, oh, the story's over. I don't want to see any of these previews. <laughs> you know what? I should I should know better, especially with DC. I, I should have learned my lesson at this point. Like, just just stop. When the book ends, just stop. If they had spoiled it, it was a, an interesting cliffhanger that you would want to know the answer to to get you back for the next issue. But I do think but I do think the comic book itself is, is pretty high quality and will have people coming back. I don't know that it'll have the first Batman White Knight effect where the, the sales went up as as the series progressed. I think there are enough people that, that probably know that they like White Knight now that they're probably not going to be late to the party this time. I don't know. I I have a one. If I just spoiled the ending for people, I apologize. Two, I think you might actually see a sales increase because of the whole flub with with the final cutoff for orders. Um, they you know DC moved the date two weeks forward and didn't announce it, so a lot of shops didn't order it like they should have or planned on. And uh, I I think this could benefit the book in a way of like when you get to issue two, three, four. You're going to see a sales increase or maybe a, a flat line, at least, which is unheard of typically uh, because they're making up for DC's mistake. So who knows? It's a very good start. We'll see where it goes. I'm giving this like a four out of five. Highly recommend. This is one of the comic books at DC to get excited about. What are your final mm -hmm. thoughts? Uh, I mean, look, if you're looking for great storytelling, both uh, narratively and in art, and you want something that's uh, engaging and dynamic, I, I think this is the book for you. It feels fresh, but it feels true to the characters, and I'm really excited to see where they take it. So good job. Good job, Sean. Josh mentioned earlier that he wasn't as big a fan of Curse of the White Knight as he was of White Knight. I actually didn't really like Curse of the White Knight at all. I did this roundup video with all the issues I had with Batman, Curse of the White Knight, I back for the trilogy because I still have faith in Chad Gordon Murphy, but I have to be honest, I didn't really like the second installment, but definitely check this out and see some of the issues I had with Curse of the White Knight.